Well, welcome everyone. I'm delighted that you can join us for this um, first of our series of advocacy webinars. This is Carol Head. I'm the president of the SALT MECFS initiative, and I'm very pleased to have women. Emily Taylor, our Advocacy and Engagement Manager, as our presenter on the topic of six ways to maximize your congressional advocacy impact. You know, congressional advocacy is both an art and a science, and it is, it is surprisingly complex. Um, so I'm really delighted that Emily brings her experience to our organization in that. Let me do a little bit of background on Emily. Um, she's been with us for about eight months, but she brings to our organization over 10 years of policy, organization, and advocacy experience in both the nonprofit and in the government sectors. Uh, she worked in Washington, D.C. for five years, and she has a very strong understanding of both federal and state policy processes, um, <coughs> as well as experience cultivating grassroots organizations, and patient representation. Prior to joining us last summer, she served as the Director of Policy and Advocacy for an award-winning autism organization. So she's deeply familiar with the challenges of uh, disease organizations, and particularly those that are, are stigmatized. When she was with the autism organization, she spearheaded major overhauls in disability, early intervention, and education policies for autism. She's also a veteran of several successful electoral campaigns where she trained others in effect in honor, with honors in politics and international relations from Scripps College in Claremont, and then earned her master's in American politics from the Claremont Graduate University. Um, and just an additional and very important for us, side note, Emily also draws in inspiration from her mother, who has battled ME as well as chronic autoimmune and thyroid conditions for over 10 years. So putting all that together, we are just delighted to have Emily here in our organization and providing this demo, this webinar. So I know Emily has a lot to cover today, so let's get started. Um, Emily, take it away. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you for that kind introduction, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Carol so kindly put out, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Advocacy and Engagement Manager here at the Solve MECFS Initiative, and today we're going to address six ways to maximize your congressional advocacy impact. Um, so we'll just dive right in. Um, here we go. There we go. Um, so you know, as, as I think it's proper for webinars to begin with a definition. I think it's tradition, and I would hate to break with, with tradition. Um, so advocacy, as defined by the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. Um, it's the process of advocating. Um, advocacy is, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of advocacy. There's big advocacy, and there's small advocacy, there's representing yourself as an individual to your doctor, to your school, to, to your local community. There's also um, representing you know, yourself or your, your issue or your loved ones on a big scale in terms of government or, um, or even international organizations. So advocacy is big and small. There, there, you do advocacy every day in your everyday life when you're standing up for someone or something, yourself or something you believe in. So, um, so when you, we talk about advocacy, it's, it's um, a very broad term. But today we're talking specifically about congressional advocacy, policy advocacy, and strategic ways to get the systems that govern our country changed. Um, so I'm going to give us, I'm just going to give you a quick recap. Um, we're going to go over kind of general advocacy best practices, and then we're going to use some case examples um, with the Solve I mean, CF, CFS initiative goals. Um, briefly talk about finding targets, because that's a key part of the advocacy process. Hopefully that will go no more than 10 minutes or so, and then we'll dive right in into the bulk of the presentation, which is specifically on congressional advocacy and your congressional impact. Um, and of course, we'll wrap up with questions and additional resources. Um, one thing I'd just like to say, um, I, I took a cooking class recently, and I, I know this sounds strange, but um, the, at the beginning of the cooking class, Chef Gabby told everyone in the class, please don't take your time trying to memorize the recipe that we're practicing today. She said, make sure while we're, while we're working together, focus on the skills and the techniques that you'll be learning because I'm sending you home with the, with the recipe, and you can do that at home. So to that end, please don't worry about writing down everything on these PowerPoint presentations or trying to scramble to, to absorb every word. I'd like you to focus today on the 
techniques and the strategies, the big picture items that we're talking about, because this webinar will be available online. These slides will be available for you to use at home. Um, so don't worry about writing everything down and, and, and getting flustered about, about the, the actual words on the screen. Um, just work on, on, on the, the big picture items, and then these are going to be available for you for your use at your own leisure. All right, so let's start with some general advocacy best practices. Um, the, 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 these are some, probably heard these before if you've worked in advocacy, these are kind of some general strategic um, ideas that are for um, when you're organizing yourself for, for conducting advocacy. Um, be strategic with policy and people, network, educate yourself, prepare and practice, persistence and follow up, and be professional, transparent, and genuine. Um, in 2015, the, uh, there was a census report that estimated that there were over 430 different federal departments. And that was estimated because our own government actually doesn't understand how many different, this is just on the federal side, agencies, programs, and processes overlap and interchange. Um, so the, just to show you kind of the scope, and that's just that's federal. It's not including state or local or, or independent government contractors on all of these different things. So what I'm trying to get at is that policy is incredibly complex. Um, the two hardest parts of advocacy, in my experience, are the first piece is navigating the power dynamic, navigating all of those crazy different systems, the 430 different government programs and agencies, and how they interact, and where the power is, um, and just trying to, to suss out that, that ball of string and try to follow it to where, where you need to be. That's the first biggest challenge of advocacy. And the second biggest challenge of advocacy is changing people and changing their minds. Because really, when it comes down to the, the nuts and bolts of our systems, they're ultimately operated by people. Um, and the hardest thing to change is someone's mind. So get, getting to system change is actually fairly easy. That's just words on paper. But getting the people to change the words that are on the paper is very hard. Um, and so um, when I just I say this because I just want to keep in mind and have everyone keep in mind when you're doing you're conducting yourself in an advocacy space that you're ultimately when push comes to shove working with individuals. Um, and people are, all of us are, fickle creatures that we are, um, influenced by an, a, amazing factors, some of which just they're having a bad day that day and you just can't control. So to that end, always be genuine, always be respectful, always be kind, because you never know which receptionist or person that you're speaking with you may not think is important that day might end up being important at, in your advocacy journey later on. So um, that's just kind of a, a couple quick ideas about general advocacy best practices. So now we're going to talk about some overall advocacy strategy. Um, this here is the Midwest Academy Strategy Organizing Chart. When I first began advocacy back in college, this was kind of the gold standard that was handed to me. And I've seen different structures and, and proposals that have come along the way as I've, as I've worked over the years. But this has been the one that they're all basically some kind of reiteration of this basic structure. As you can see, we have goals, organizational considerations, constituents, allies, and opponents, targets, and tactics. And each of these columns is, is, uh, is delineated with a list of questions and kind of key points that you want to keep in mind as you're working. So the goals, um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. These are your big picture items, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and this is for anyone who's worked in business, uh, some key things to keep in mind about goals is the acronym SMART, S-M-R-T. S standing for specific, you want your goals to be specific. M standing for measurable, you want a way to measure if you're succeeding in your goals. Um, A standing for attainable, you don't want to set a goal that you can't reach. R standing for relevant, you want to make sure it's relevant to what you're trying to actually accomplish. And T being time-based, you don't want these goals to just go on forever and then you never, you never have any timeline to succeed. So um, we're not really getting into goals. I could probably do an entire webinar just on goals. I'll probably do an entire webinar on each one of these categories. Um, but we're going to just kind of give a quick overview to see where congressional advocacy fits in this overall advocacy process. Um, organizational considerations, we'll see I'll block that out and I put in resources on top of that. As an individual advocate, obviously you're not working in an in organizational constraint. You don't have to worry about budgets or staff time or things like that. When we so I just replace that with resources, things that what do, tools do you have at your disposal? Uh, do you have a phone? Do you have internet? Does your, uh, your local congressional office have a, have a dis disabled accessibility process? Is there, is there free transportation to that? Those are resources that you can use to help your advocacy. Um, and of course, a big resource is organizations like the Solve MECFS Initiative, 
because we're here to help you on that journey and provide resources as well. The next component is constituents and allies. Um, you know, as an individual advocate, you're not going to run into too many opponents, um, but allies are people like friends, your family, people you can call upon, coworkers, and of course also, you know, other people in the community, the advocacy community, and organizations like Solve MECFS Initiative, these can all be allies to help you on your journey. Um, for targets, I'm just going to, I could, again, I could do a whole, probably, series of classes on how to find targets, because it's one of the most challenging processes of advocacy in my experience. But we know that we're talking today about Congress. So I just put Congress on top of that and just kind of, and so when we're talking about your congressional advocacy specifically, you want to make sure you're drilling down to the appropriate people in the offices. And we'll go into that in just a moment. But everyone, I think, recognizes that there's not more than just the member involved in the congressional process. There's also, um, there are members of staff, there's different committees, there's, um, there's of course, the Senate and versus the House, which is the appropriate person to ask. So you, you want to make sure you're drilling down into the different systems of the con congressional legislative body and make, making sure you're finding the right person there. And of course, ultimately, what we're getting today is tactics. That's our primary conversation today. Um, so let's kind of dive in a little bit. Um, so the Solve ME CFS, CFS initiative, these are an example of some of our advocacy goals. We have the goal of expanding and accelerating research investment. We want to expedite government response to the ME CFS public health crisis. We want to increase the quality and accessibility of support for patients, and we want to raise awareness and improve understanding of the MEC, of MECFS in the general public. These are some goals that we're trying to attain. Um, so when you look at those goals, you have to match those to your targets. And again, this is one of the most complex processes in, in advocacy, and this is a super oversimplified version. Um, so when you're when you're looking at your targets, you want to do your research. Am I contacting the right person? But this is a quick walkthrough of kind of how that process on a very thirty thousand foot level works. Um, you match your goal to your need. So um, your goal would be, for example, in, in this little uh, target example, we have research. If our goal is research, we recognize that we need money. Money is what funds research. The largest source of research dollars in the United States is the NIH. And then that would be our initial target. And then we drill down into the NIH to find specifically which target we're looking for. Another example is the government response. If we're uh, attempting to get a government response to MECFS, um, we know that we need a law to help accomplish that. And, um, and of course, Congress is the one that makes laws. So this is a very, very broad example of how the target process works. And again, this is probably one of the most complex processes. But um, we know that for this webinar, we're going straight to Congress. Um, so just a reminder, um, all these first categories, the, um, the goals, the resources, your allies and constituents, that's where an organization like the Solve MECFS initiative really comes into play. We have the depth of knowledge, the expertise, the resources to, to do all of that heavy lifting. And so as an individual advocate, um, you're, uh, one of the, the positive roles that you can play as is, is, is an organizer in the community is stepping in once the, the big picture campaign work is done and to really you know, do the grassroots, get, get into the weeds, get into the trenches, and, and make your voice and your story powerful. So we're focusing again on Congress, and we're going to dive right into the tactics when we're facing Congress. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment to understand the congressional office and the congressional office structure. Um, folks who work for a member of Congress are called personal staff. In a Senate office, this can be anywhere between 20 to 60 individuals who work in, a, who work in the Senate office. In a representative uh, on, the, on the House side, this is actually limited by legislation to 18 full-time staff and four part-time staff. Um, now, this can be assisted or uh, supplemented by uh, committee staff, because committees actually have their own staff with their own structure that support folks in, in that capacity. Um, now, there, what are the roles of a congressional office? Um, the roles of a congressional office, and they have four different items that they work on. The first one um, is no surprise to anyone is legislative uh, is, is is legislative work. They are there to make laws and fulfill that obligation. The second one is constituent service. They are there to provide um, a service and assistance to folks who live and and um, and have businesses in their district. Um, the third function is actually a political function. They have a, a, they being the uh, member of Congress have obligations. Um, on the political side to both their party um, and their fundraising targets. And so actually, and this is something that's very controversial now, a huge part of 
the uh, congressional staff structure is actually organized around fundraising and um, and and uh, party politics and, and sort of uh, Democratic or Republican internal party uh, party obligations. And of course, uh, there's also the administrative task in a congressional office. Things like budgeting, reporting, communications, all those fall into um, what we would call administrative tasks. Um, so when you're looking at the structure of a congressional office, um, you see on the left here, this is how uh, we sort of in a perfect world in the theory of a congressional office, how it's supposed to work. Um, and as you can see on the right, that the reality is a lot more messy. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the silos of, of um, different areas of service, for example, constituent services, um, are not as, uh, as ironclad as I think we, we like to envision them. The folks who are responsible for con constituent services, um, field representatives and caseworkers, are often shoved into the role of doing legislative work and vice versa. For example, the legislative correspondents, as you see on the bottom there, are actually supposed to be working on the constituent level and providing impact and results and information back to the constituents in the district. However, in reality, they end up working far more on policy, even though that's not technically their function. Um, so I could probably go on for another half an hour about all the different ways in which the congressional reality of a staff structure um, is not, uh, not as they, the theory would, would reflect. Um, and it also varies very much office to office. And that's one thing to keep in mind, is that while this is kind of the generalized perspective of how a congressional office is structured, individual members may have different um, different priorities. If a member is more involved in party politics, if they have a party leadership role, they might cut some of their staff from the legislative side. If a, mem if a member is very involved in their district and has a lot of emphasis on constituent services, they again might cut some of the legislative work. So it really depends on what the member chooses to emphasize within their own office and how, um, and how they build their staff internally. Um, so now we'll go into our, um, our, our how, to, how to work with Congress and how to address Congress. So I have here six steps that I define as a successful congressional moment. These are moments where you pick up the phone and speak to a member of Congress or their representatives in the office. This is where you meet them at a town hall when you have an elevator moment. You have three minutes to make your point. These are successful congressional moments. And um, they, they consist of kind of a pretty straightforward cycle. You introduce yourself. Be upfront about what you're asking for. Connect the impact of what you're asking for to the district specifically. Tell your story. Be prepared. And know your next step. Now, there's also building a, a successful congressional relationship. This is more of a long-term process in which you're really working hand-in-hand -hand with the office to some broader goal. Um, this, this also has six steps. So these are similar. You want to meet with the office, state your goals, make it personal, connect policy to reality, be a source of information, and recommend concrete action. Now, you might notice that these things line up a little bit. And so in a way, with this webinar, I think we, we might have misnamed it. We're giving you two for one. So these are six ways to maximize your congressional advocacy impact. There's the moment and the relationship. And I think why I draw these together and why I show them here in parallel, one matching the other, is because it's really part of a system, of a structure that's a broader advocacy component. When you have your congressional moment, it's a mini version or a microcosm of when you're building that relationship, which is just a, a, a compilation of moments. And you build those moments, one on top of another, um, to build that relationship. And then you build that relationship further and further until you get to your policy outcome goal. So it's, it's really just kind of a rinse and repeat cycle where you take each of these items and, and you repeat them over and over as an advocate, bringing one point, building upon the next point, one ask, building upon the next ask, until you reach your goal. Um, so you'll see that these line up, and so we're actually going to be taking these one at a time and going through in depth these different components and how they they build into a stronger advocacy effort um, in its entirety. So item one, introduce yourself and meet with the office. Um, so on the moment side, this is again your your brief phone calls, your uh, your your lobbying days, your um, your one time opportunities to to find the member in an elevator um, is the the introduce yourself step. The, the step one. 
Um, when you're going to introduce yourself for a moment, you want to give your full name, um, your contact information, so in case they do want to follow up with you, they know how to reach you, um, your zip code. This is very important. You should have that um, prepared and also the plus four, which I know most of us don't really keep readily at hand, um, because that establishes you as a member of the constituency, and, um, and members really do have an obligation, and they, and they value their constituents, and will give that person far more credit in time of day than they would for a non-constituent. Um, a community connection. This is something that I really encourage folks to do when they're having that first moment with their representative. Um, it, it, it's, just a, it's a quick, you know, half a sentence in your conversation where you mention something um, along the lines of, I'm a member of, of XYZ church, or my son goes to XYZ school. And it's some, uh, you know, visible element of the community that really ties you to, um, to that community. And I think that's a, and that community connection, I think it's a very strong um, at, advocacy tactic to use in that brief moment with your introduction. And I, and I also have to, to, to clarify that when you're in your congressional moment, um, and, and we're using the, the items and the strategies on the left side, these are very quick, very streamlined. You have, you know, again, three minutes tops. So these are going to come out very quickly, and preparation and practice is really key here. Um, now on the right, with your relationship, this is something that would probably be happening in your first meeting. So it's probably some, a conversation that happens between a half an hour to 45 minutes. So you can go into a bit more depth and have a bit more, um, a bit more uh, detail in, the, in that element. Um, so now back to the left-hand side when you're um, having your congressional moment. Um, you want to state your relationship to the issue. Um, this is usually, again, a half a sentence, very quick. Something along the lines of, you know, my mother has MECFS. Or, um, you know, my, my son's uh, school is really impacted by this. Something that's very quick, um, again, half a sentence that kind of shows why this, really, this issue is something that you care about. Um, the employment or background, I've heard different things about whether or not to include. Um, some folks are very pro uh, mentioning your employment or background. Some people are very against. Personally, I think it depends on if it's relevant and how you feel about sharing that information. So to give you an example of how this would break down, um, something like, my name is Joe, I'm a firefighter, and I care about government pensions, something like that. The firefighter would be relevant. But if I, you know, my name is Susie, I'm an accountant, and I'm calling you about environmental issues, might not be as relevant or as, as important to the situation. So um, it's really, I think it's up to your discretion. I would recognize that your your, your employment and what, and what you do for a living or, or what you your background and your role in the community is valuable. Um, just whether or not to share it, I think, is, is at your discretion. Um, and then this is the other question I get a lot about, whether or not you should mention that you're a donor or a supporter of the individual that you're speaking to. Um, I've heard this both ways. I've heard some staffers tell me, that they really don't like this. They feel that when someone's like, I voted for your, your member, and, um, and so therefore you owe me something, they don't particularly enjoy that. Um, and, and some folks say that they do like that. They know that they like the positive reinforcement. Or if they say, you know, I'm a donor of your campaign, and um, I volunteered for you for the last two primary cycles, something like that, um, it, it, does, it does create that stronger connection. So again, I, I, I think that this needs to be considered, and it should be up to your discretion. Um, I would say feel out the conversation if you have the time and you think it's relevant to mention that you have some kind of history of support or donation with the member, um, then then go for it. Um, but it, but as, you know, but again, feel out the conversation. With some staff, it can actually be harmful. Um, and as we know that um, big donors have a lot of opportunities to have face to faces with members that that small donors don't. Sometimes small donors even have those opportunities that non donors don't. And of course, volunteers get the opportunity to be in the Congress in the congressional members day to day during the during the campaign season. So this is one of those areas that you that you, it, there's no solid answer. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, but I'm throwing it out there so that you can use your best judgment about whether or not that's a tactic that works well for you. Now we'll move on to the right side um, when you're building your uh, your congressional relationship. Um, again, it's sort of the same thing. It's the it's the meet your meet the office for the first time. Again, usually a half an hour to 45 minute meeting. And it's basically the introduce yourself. It's, it's, um, I describe it, and I've been told from, from my trainers before, that it's something like a first date. Um, you want to be formal. You want to be on time. You want to be well-dressed. Um, and, and you want to be prepared. And, and, it, and it's kind of the feeling out whether or not this is going to be a long-term investment of the congressman's time and energy, especially the staff first. 
because you're most likely meeting with uh, a staffer for that first meeting um, in the office. Um, so, of course, you want to prepare and research. You don't want to go into your meeting unprepared. Um, you want to establish your credibility. This is a key one. Um, so when you're start talking about building a relationship, you want to be a credible source. You want to be an organization that's not going to detriment or, or be, um, or be a, a, a hindrance politically to this office. So you want to establish your credibility, um, that you, that you um, have credible information, that, you, that your facts are well-based, that, um, that you don't have any, uh, any snags in terms of like, you know, potentially being a lobbyist or potentially having connections on a personal level that with a financial gain, things of that nature. Um, other items is keep it positive. Um, you know, you don't want to go into your first date and talk about how you live in your mother's basement. You want to talk about how you're a really great person to be with. So um, again, so that first relationship, that first building in the very initial meeting, you want to keep it positive that they want to work with you. Um, you want to impart credible info. This kind of uh, taps along with the established credibility. Um, obviously, if you, if you present information on your first date and it turns out to be false, that's a big red flag that's going to turn someone off from working with you in the future. So you want to make sure that your sources are impeccable, especially at the first meeting. And of course, the first meeting you want easy asks. You're not going to ask somebody to marry you on the first date, um, at least not if you expect them to, to say yes. Um, so your, your first ask in that first meeting needs to be something that's a very, what we call low-hanging fruit, something that would be easy and attainable without an investment of too much political capital on the part of the office. Things like, um, would you send a tweet of support or co-sign a, a, a symbolic resolution or, you know, can we count on you to wear blue on MECFS International Awareness Day? Things like that that are very easy, very very simple, and establish that building of trust for a long-term relationship. Um, so now we move on to point two in our, our six-point process of, um, of building congressional advocacy. Um, well, again, the moment being those short conversations for our beginner advocates on the left, and then the relationship being the long-term building structure of a, of a congressional um, in interaction and, and, and collaboration on the right. So um, on the left, be upfront about your ask. This is um, really important, especially when you're doing phone calls and short little moments like that. You want to say straight up what you're, what you're calling about. So my name is Emily. I live at this zip code, which is in your district, and I care about MECFS. That's, that's perfect. Um, so this is also, um, it, it folds into uh, the repetition process. So you want to repeat your ask. So you start big, start general, and move to specifics. So you start with, my name is Emily. I believe in MEC, I, I believe MECFS needs government attention. And then you drill down with your next part. You say, this is important to me because my mother is sick. And the NIH needs to do more. That's the second part. You do you repeat your ask. But each time you repeat your ask, you drill down a little more specifically. Um, so the, the, that that's kind of the general process. And, and usually, I, you know, the rule of threes. I highly recommend you rec you, you repeat your ask three times, and uh, you can do it in three different ways, or say it the same way over and over. Both are both are strong tactics. Um, but again, you want to start general and move down to specific. So you know, my name is Emily. I care about MECFS. My mother is sick. I need the NIH to do something. Um, you know, she's been sick for so long. It's, uh, it's so hard to watch her suffer. I really want the NIH to, to invest in R21 research grants. So that's kind of where you bring it down. You start big, go in more specific, and then really you're, you're very specific, very targeted, narrow ask at the very bottom. Um, you want to make sure that you're speaking to the right person or the right office. Um, so if I'm, if I'm talking about NIH items, and I'm speaking to somebody who's on the Foreign Relations Committee, they're going to be like, that's great. I can't do much to help you. Um, so, and of course, unless it's your, your, your actual representative, in which case they're, they're obligated to help you because they serve you specifically. Um, so you want to make sure if you're, if you're talking to an office that's not your actual representative, you want to make sure they're on a relevant committee or a relevant body of power that can make a difference on the issue. And you also want to make sure you're talking to the right person just within the office. We, we went to that congressional structure about what those different roles are, if you're talking to a, a field worker or a caseworker, their job is mainly constituent services. And they can definitely pass your message along the food chain because, as we showed, the reality of congressional offices is messy. But they're not necessarily going to be able to, to do more than that. So you want to make sure that you're, you're, um, the, the, the person that you have on the line or the person that you have um, in front of you 
it can, can at least get your message to the right place, and that should be part of your ask if you know that they're not the right person. And if they are the right person, then hit home really hard with your ask. Um, of course, be clear and concise. Um, you, you, again, these, in, the, in the moments, these are very short points of time, so you have to get a lot of information very quickly. Um, so it doesn't help to dwell on, you know, if I'm telling my name is Emily, I care about MECFS. Um, did you know that MECFS has been stigmatized for over 30 years and there's been terrible underfunding? And uh, oh my goodness, I can tell you about the, the, the PACE study. Let me tell you about the PACE study. Um, and then by that time, they're already zoned out. So um, you want to keep it, keep it moving and keep it uh, on a very clear track to exactly what your ask is going to be. Um, and then, of course, check your terms. This is something that I think a lot of people overlook when they're having those, those moments. They, you know, the adrenaline's pumping. You get a little flustered. You got this person for, for 40 more seconds. Oh, my goodness. But, um, but you got you to keep your head and, um, and make sure that whatever term or acronym you're using is something that they understand. Um, I know a lot of legislative correspondents and legislative directors, their job is to understand policy. They eat, drink, and breathe it. So they probably will know a lot of the, the government acronyms, things like the NIH, the CDC, that we all in the advocacy community use so frequently. Um, but sometimes the members do not. Um, the members actually don't even read a lot of the policy that they sign. So when you have that moment, make sure if you say MECFS, they might not know what that is. And you might need to say, do you know what MECFS is? Oh, well, MECFS stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is commonly known as chronic fatigue syndrome here in the United States. Um, which is the CFS part. And sometimes you have to break it down for them. You know, even things like the National Institutes of Health, the, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, you know, make sure that whatever terminology you're using um, you know, is, is, is what the, that particular office utilizes. And, and, and take that, that extra 10 seconds to make sure you guys are on the same page. Because the last thing you want is your, your, your message to, um, to suddenly get lumped to the wrong staffer. Um, so now we we'll switch to um, the right-hand side, which is our relationship uh, er area. So if you're building that long-term congressional relationship. Um, and again, so we're talking on point two. So this is um, probably your follow-up to your initial meeting after you, after you had the, the first date. And, um, and here you're going to really, uh, you're really going to get into where you want this relationship to go. Um, so this is where you want to state your goals. And what is the difference between a goal and an ask? Because that's a very key point that should definitely be elaborated on um, in terms of your relationship to this congressional office. So um, we, we have our goals, which are, um, as we talked about in the, in the Midwest Advocacy Organizing Chart, your big picture items. We want more research dollars. We want government action. We want something in that big area. Um, you know, we want increased support services for patients, things of that nature that are big. Um, and now this is, this is the part in the conversation where you state your broad goals. Not quite you want to get to your ask yet. Um, the ask, more specifically, are we want you to pass SB 99, or we want you to, um, to specifically pass a resolution that makes the NIH do this. Those are specific asks. They're very targeted, very narrow, and usually are associated with a specific point of policy. Your goals are much broader, bigger picture items. You know, we want more clinical care. We want more research funding. Those are goals. So when you get kind of point two of building this congressional relationship, you want to be very upfront about where you want to be going. Our ultimate goal is to cure MECFS. You know, that's a goal, and you can lay that out, and, and, just, and that should be very transparent and on the table. You want the staffers to know exactly where you're heading. Um, and again, start general and move into specifics. So, and, um, and, and the last point, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, the last point on that right-hand side is ensure your target shares your objectives. So, if you, so when you're starting general and you say our goal is to cure MECFS, you want to stop there and be like, is this something that the congressman would agree with? And, you know, obviously, especially the bigger and, and, and you, you start, the answer should be yes. But if you start at, we want to cure MECFS or find a treatment for MECFS, is that something the congressman would agree with? And the staffer looks at you and says, you know, he doesn't really believe in, in research funding. Then you're probably wasting your time. So this is a good point in the conversation um, as you're building that congressional relationship to make sure that you're, you, you guys are on the same page in your big picture items. You guys may disagree on policy, and then you can go back and forth about which policy or which law is the best way to accomplish your goal. But you got to make sure that coming right out of the gate that you guys are all on the same page. 
our goal is to get increased research funding for MECFS. Is that something the congressman would support in theory? Yes. Then you go into specifics. And also, when you're building that congressional relationship um, in that goal component, the transparency is vital. Um, you don't want, at this point in, in, in this budding relationship for long-term uh, for long-term progress, you don't want to have suddenly it come out that, um, well, my brother works for this pharmaceutical company that might profit from this legislation. That's the last thing you need coming out, um, you know, later. So if they, if there is some sort of connection like that, if there is something that needs to be revealed, this is the point where you do so. It's a just, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, you know, I work for the Solve MECFS initiative. I am a paid staff of the Solve MECFS initiative. And they're like, okay, got it. You know, you don't want that to, to somehow inhibit your relationship later on. Um, and so I think that's that's a good point to move on. So that um, about points um, in terms of your second steps of your relationship. And again, these are kind of rinse and repeat steps. So you're going to anticipate um, going through these again and again with different members of staff as you move through in your congressional um, advocacy. So we'll move on to point three. Um, again, the moment on the left side, the relationship on the right side, and it's connect the impact to their district or um, for relationship building, make it personal. Um, when you're in the moment, this is, um, again, really compelling facts and figures can be very quick to accomplish this task without taking up too much of your precious time. Um, I believe there's some numbers floating around that specifically break down each of the MECFS prevalence rates and estimates by congressional district. That, that's a really, really valuable piece of information so that you can readily and quickly say there's an estimated 25,000 patients in California District 44 or whatever the number is specifically. Um, and, that, and that immediately connects the impact to the district and doesn't take up so much time. Um, financial cost is a really good uh, point item there, uh, especially if you can get it specifically to district um, or a particular industry that's very prevalent in the district. So, so um, for example, coal miners in Appalachia is, is, is a very powerful one. Um, you know, school teachers, always great, um, anything in the education system. So uh, things like those numbers that, you know, and it's estimated that 18% of school truancy, I, I'm making up these numbers, but if we had them, that'd be great. You know, it's estimated that X amount of school truancy is caused by MECFS. Um, that's a very real-world example, a very specific cost that ties it immediately to the district um, and, and makes it something that the member would, uh, would react to and care about. And um, again, being rec recognizing that you're at a limited amount of time to accomplish this task. Um, another way to go about getting that connection to the district is, of course, a personal connection to the member or staff. Um, that's always probably the most valuable and the best, uh, the best tool in your toolkit if you can say, you know, Susie on your staff in the district office has MECFS or something along those lines. Um, those things can really bring it home very quickly, and, and it's very motivating for members of Congress. Um, local government and business is also another, another tool in, in your toolkit, um, especially uh, in city and county governments, in big cities and counties, um, especially, for example, here in California, our counties and our um, boards of supervisors are very powerful entities in terms of local government, and they have a lot of sway with their members of Congress. I'm not sure if that, if that carries over to other states in the same capacity, but um, because California is so big and bigger states in general really rely heavily on those county and city structures because the state is just so big it can't step in on, an, uh, on, a, on a detailed level. So when the state of San Bernardino or sorry, I'm going to say the city of San Bernardino or the, the county of Los Angeles has uh, passed a resolution or has publicly stated that this, is a, that this is important and costing them money, that's something that will definitely get uh, legislative members to pay attention because they rely so heavily on those local st st structures and systems. And of course, um, leverage local allies. This is a really great one. Um, a lot of local community groups, things like the Lions Club and Rotary Clubs and, you know, local Girl Scout troops, those kind of things are, are the backbones of what a lot of congressional members utilize to get their information out into the community. So if you've noticed that a particular organization is working very closely, it has a strong relationship with the member, you can, you know, approach that organization and say, is this something that you would be interested in supporting? And if they say yes, then you have your, your talking point right there. When you get your moment in front of the member of Congress, you can say, Girl Scout Troop 682 really believes in this issue. And, and if, they, if, that's a, if that's a point that the congressman knows is important to their structure, that'll get their attention as well.
Um, so now we're moving on from the moment category on the left to the relationship area on the right. So again, the similar structure, you're just rinsing and repeating the same tactic, but you're doing them repeatedly over and over, um, creating that depth, like the layers of an onion, to create that long-term relationship. Um, so we're going to make it personal. This is usually at the third or fourth meeting with your members of Congress or with, the, with their staff, and you're building that relationship, and you, and you want to you wanna get that hook in. This is kind of, you know, in the previous meetings, they're going through emotions. It's, it's about politics. It's about, you know, the district. When you get into that, to this point, this is where you're going to light the fire, get the passion. Um, and so this is where stories and testimony become very valuable. Um, this, I, I highly encourage people to bring in experts and other folks um, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the meeting room. Use pictures. Um, Self-advocates are phenomenal. Definitely have those folks uh, step into the room and work with you. Um, also, local government and business, again, um, you see this is in both categories, can make a really strong impression here, especially if it's a business that's, that's a funder. And, um, and leveraging local allies, you know, Girl, Girl Scout Troop 62 or whoever they are might be the, the, the ticket into making this relationship soar. All right, so I, I noticed 1045, so I'm going to try and move through the last parts quickly. Um, you want to tell your story, um, and this is on the left in the moment, and then connect policy to reality. This is really the same point. This is um, telling your story is a very personal, tangible way of making a policy connected to reality, and a policy being something that the government's doing or a particular law, and of course the reality is where the rubber hits the road, where this policy really impacts human beings, um, and that's where your story is very powerful. So you want to prepare and practice your story, um, link your story to your talking points. Um, you don't you don't want to embellish your story. You know, if your your story is is yours, it's, you should be honest and authentic and own it. Um, and don't dwell on the bad. A lot of staffers tell me that, you know, people don't come to them when things are working well. All they hear is stories of things gone bad. And it, and it sort of creates a wall there. They get um, either, you know, either too emotional and they kind of pull away or they sort of become numb to it. So if you spend your whole precious moments with your congressman talking about how horrible your experience has been, that, that's not getting to the point. You know, you can make, you, you don't want to, skim over it. You don't want to minimize how bad your story is, but at the same time, you don't want to focus zero in on it too strongly. Um, you just want to you just want to state it and, and move on. Um, it's okay to be emotional, though, because this is your story. This is your experience, and I imagine that um, if, it's, if it's strong enough to drive you to share it with a member of Congress, that it's a pretty powerful experience. So don't sugarcoat your emotions. If you're sad and you feel like you're tearing up, you, you, that's okay. You know that 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 adds power to and legitimacy to what your experience um, has has affected you. And of course, connect your story to your ask. If you tell them about how your experience with MECFS has just devastated the lives of you and your kids and your family, and 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 it's all of the bad things it's done to you, and then you don't make that, and the NIH can do something about it, you've lost your opportunity. So always follow up immediately after you have that emotional storytelling moment with this is how you can help, or this policy is what can make a difference for my life. Um, pretty much the same thing on the right-hand side when you're building the relationship, um, except you kind of, instead of making it a very personal experience, what you build on that personal experience and make it part of the narrative or the, 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 the community experience. Um, the, telling your story is just um, a, a, a simple, is a very straightforward individual experience, and then Drawing the universal experience is a sophisticated way of doing that. Um, so, of course, you want to identify the opposition. This is a good point in that when you're when you have that moment, you're like, "This is what we can do. This is the policy we can change. Who's going to stop us?" This is the good moment to bring that up. All right, number five: be prepared and be a source of information. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this too much because again, we're running slightly short on time. But, um, but you want to um, have that information available and make sure it's credible. You make sure you're part of the team. And one thing I hear from staffers a lot, because staffers are smart folk who are involved with their fingers in a lot of different issues. Um, they, they, they hear a lot of things over and over again. And so they often say, tell me something I don't know. So if you can educate them and give them that one fact that they didn't know, that's very valuable to them. Um, and then also, while, while you're on that point, um, don't mix your issues. If you're um, very upset about the NIH, but you know the CDC is also not doing so great work, 
you know, don't bring up the CDC if you're talking about the NIH and your ask is on the NIH. You've got to stay on target and, and keep your issues streamlined. And last point, um, know your next step and, of course, recommend concrete action. This is the crescendo of your, of your, your three-minute moment or the crescendo of this two-year relationship you've been building with the staff. Um, you you want to make sure your next step is realistic. You want to make sure it's something that, that they can accomplish. And if you're on the relationship side and you're building big policy relationships, you want to make sure that you're realistic about what this is going to do. And I'd like to, the very last point, the gain from failure, um, impart a short story to you that was one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was working with my, with my legislative counsel in D.C. And, um, and they told me when we had sat there, we had gone through our plan, we have created our goals, we have gone through our strategies, we have got our resources, we have got our targets, we're ready to hit the ball rolling. We sat down and we plucked out every area the, the plan could fail. And we went through each of the potential failure options. What if we land in this committee and we get shut out? What if, um, what if we lose this supporter? We go through every way the plan can fail. And we look at it and we say, if it fails here, are we still in a bit better position when we come back and try again? And if the answer is yes to all your failure points, you're on the right track. You always want to you know, understand that in Congress, and this is in the 114th Congress, of the bills that were submitted for legislation, only 2%, 2% passed. So you have to understand that when you're working this system, it is highly geared towards failure. Um, and, but you have to know that you're going to come back, you're going to do it again, and are you stronger for having made the effort? And if you know that you've made a little bit of gain, then you're on the right path. And so, again, you rinse, these repeat, re rinse and repeat these steps over and over from the very first interaction with your member of Congress at a town hall from that very first phone call to that very first meeting to proposing legislation. It's all part of the same six-step process over and over again, building layer upon layer until you reach your goal. And every failure, just you want to make sure it puts you one step closer to succeeding. So those are uh, my six steps to, uh, to successful congressional advocacy. It's more of a system than it is um, any particular steps. And again, they build upon one another. And while we have a quick moment remaining, um, I just wanted to, these were some of the questions that I received by email prior to the webinar. So I wanted to answer these for the folks at home really quickly. Um, and then again, we are receiving your questions and we're, we're keeping them written down. So um, I will make sure to answer those on a, on a blog post or social media. We'll make sure to get those answers out to you. Um, so here's the previously submitted questions that I received. What is the difference between advocacy and lobbying? This is a great question. Um, at the nuts and bolts core, advocacy and lobbying are essentially the same thing. When you advocate for something, you're, it's essentially, you know, you're trying to create systems change, you're trying to change laws, you're trying to represent a particular point of view, and lobbying is essentially the exact same thing. You're, they're trying to, to present a certain point of view, you're trying to change laws, you're trying to get the policy results that you want. The real difference between advocacy and lobbying comes in the tax code. It's the definitional way of how your resources are spent. So as an individual, um, you don't have to worry about this too much because your, your individual effort in, in um, contacting your member of Congress is, is not lobbying. This is their job. Their job is to serve their community, and you're part of that. So it doesn't fall into lobbying. It's, it's pretty much straight advocacy. The jump from advocacy, advocacy to lobbying comes primarily in um, when, when dollars are involved, especially big dollars, staff time, office space, resources, those kind of things, and wh how those dollars are being used. And especially as a nonprofit organization, um, th this is where we, we are very aware of these laws. Um, we can spend, and I, I, last I checked the IRS regulation, 8% of our resources on lobbying. And lobbying, under the federal definition, is any time we ask or encourage others to ask for a specific policy goal. So if we go to Congress and we say, we want you to pass SB 99 or HR 233, that's lobbying. If we say, we want you to talk to the NIH about doing better for research, that's not lobbying because it's not a specific policy goal. Um, so those are, that's, that's an important differentiation for organizations like ours who are using precious dollars in every way we can to be effective. Um, but for an individual who, um, who's just talking to their congressman, it's not too relevant for your work. Um, second question I received, should I speak to my district staff or D.C. staff, and who is better? 
Um, that is a great question. And we looked at the, uh, the organization of a congressional office earlier in the webinar. Um, and, and it comes down to what you're asking for. If you're asking for something that's relevant to the work in D.C., a legislative policy change, something along those lines, most of the time I'd recommend you go to D.C., most of the time. But every office is coordinated differently. And so some congressional offices actually operate their legislative components out of the district office. Or some offices, you know, specifically keep a particular policy person, um, you know, health, transportation, or whichever, in the district office. So it, it, it's, it's um, a general rule to go to D.C. if you're talking about policy issues, but it's not a firm rule because um, some of these experts, you know, and as we saw with the right-hand side of that congressional organizing chart and the many arrows going off of the ways, um, they, they're not necessarily it's a, a one-way communication. It's not necessarily a clear line of communication. So what I highly recommend doing is just calling and asking a particular office. Um, you know, the folks at the front desk, especially the interns, they probably have their ear to the ground more than anybody on how the particular office has its unique ups and downs. Um, so definitely, you know, take, take the time to, um, to check in with how the office is structured. Make sure you're talking to the right person. And, um, and, they'll, and, they're, and again, they're public servants. It's their job to get you to the right person. Number three, or question number three that I received. Um, can I get disability accommodations to see my, my, my representative, or can I appoint a proxy? These are kind of two parts of the same question. Um, the answer is yes and yes. Um, they are public spaces, so they are required under the Americans with Disabilities Act to have all re uh, reasonable accommodations for folks with disabilities. Many folks with public transit systems actually will provide free transportation to your congressional office if you, if you schedule it ahead of time. It is part of their job as public servants to get you into a public space so that you can be part of your, your government process. Can I appoint a proxy? Also, yes. Um, I highly encourage this for folks who are, you know, housebound or bedbound and, you know, you want to spend your precious energy um, where you want to spend it the most. So you can um, sign a quick letter or even just um, a handwritten note that says, you know, my name is Emily. I am very sick. I appoint Carol to speak on my behalf. And um, something like that is, is very valuable. And it really does, I think, present a strong case that there are a lot of people out there who are invisible, who are missing, and, um, and can't make their voices heard. And so um, that's a very powerful way to do so. All right, last question that I received by email. Um, do I still have to contact my representative if they are doing the right thing? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, just imagine that every time you contact your representative and say, hey, just telling you, good job. I really like what you're doing. You're counteracting one phone call from someone else who said, hey, stop doing that. I don't like it. So they absolutely need your feedback consistently, to, even if they're on the right track. Um, and, and I think that especially for folks who are in uh, comfortable districts where their, their representatives have strong, overwhelming support with not, uh, not a close voting margin, this is, this, people get um, a little bit spoiled by the fact that they agree with their representative, they feel they're doing the right thing, and they don't feel the need to constantly yell at them to make sure they're doing the right thing. But you still need to give them that positive reinforcement, because if they only hear calls from the people who are unhappy, then they're not going to keep doing the right thing, they're going to change their policy. So you need to stay, still stay in contact with your representative, just tell them good job if you think they're doing a good job. All right, so um, I have a couple of additional resources on the screen. Um, I know that we are five minutes out from end time, um, so I'm going to leave this on the screen for a moment, and again, this will be available for you to take home. The first item is the Midwest Academy Organizing Strategy Chart that I, that I used earlier in the presentation. The next two are um, actually from the disability world, from when I worked as an autism director of policy, um, the legislative handbook from the Association of People Supporting Employment First, a disability rights organization, and also becoming an effective advocate from the disability rights uh, in Wisconsin. Great, great uh, primers and documents for um, a lot of this information um, is, is kind of the, the nuts and bolts are in there. And the last item, I'll just give a quick caveat. This is um, an item called Indivisible. It's a handbook from former congressional staffers to reveal best practices of congressional advocacy. It is very partisan. It's written in the light of opposition to the Trump administration, but all of the tactics and everything there is actually drawn from Tea Party uh, organizational strategies. So it's a little bit bipartisan, um, but for, uh, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing its particular uh, political leanings in this particular case. I'm just saying it's a good strategy, guys. 
And with that, I, I thank you, Emily. Emily, you have covered so much information, and I think it is important that this is available in the future uh, for folks to uh, listen to and watch again, because uh, there's a lot to absorb. Thank you so very much. Um, just a quick reminder, again, this is Carol Head. I'm the president of SMCI, and we do have additional webinars for which you can sign up. We do hope that you'll sign up for our biweekly emails with updates about information, just general information of interest about what's happening in the world of MECFS. Um, and really, you know, one of the uh, not so subtle elements of this uh, advocacy webinar is we, you know, it's, it's under Emily's leadership. Her passion for the issue and her deep knowledge of how to do effective advocacy. We do need and want um, folks to align with us and uh, communicate with Emily so that we can work together with you to fight uh, for the rights of MECFS patients. So with that, I believe we are uh, finished. Oh, please, as always, <laughs> um, we, we do welcome you to join us in our various online communities and social media. So. Thank you all so much. I do hope that this was useful. Um, we have research webinars coming up, and we will be doing, uh, our expectation is to do four of these advocacy webinars in the year 2017. So more to come. Uh, we've touched the surface. Hope that you found this useful. You know, together we are strong. We understand um, that the depth of passion and care that we all have uh, to change our federal government and our local gov and state governments as regards um, justice for MECFS patients. So thank you so much for joining us. Take care and goodbye.